since we have uh, a number of online speakers, it uh, appears that we have a little technical difficulty, but we'll solve that very soon so we can get started. Uh, we will also be showing some slides, at least some of the speakers. Uh, otherwise, Fadim, we can maybe change the order of speakers if they are not available right now. So this workshop is about AI and environment and the connection between the two. Uh, so it's my, my great pleasure here to be in Kyoto, first of all. I also have some colleagues here and some friends from different parts. We also have a number of people that are following online, even though right now in we've combined everything, right? We are in presence, we're online. Nice to see familiar faces and less familiar faces in the room. Nice and friendly faces. I'm sure that we also have nice and friendly faces online. So thank you for coming to this workshop. The Council of Europe obviously has had a very special interest in both artificial intelligence and environment for a number of years. And we've developed a number of both um, treaties, but also partial agreements around environment. We're currently working on a new treaty on artificial intelligence. Both th these things were put to the forefront in our um, summit of heads of state and government in Reykjavik, uh, where the heads of government and the heads of state and government also requested that uh, we pay particular attention to that and devise new tools in this field. Council of Europe works in that not only with a specific committee on artificial intelligence, but has a number of services that are looking directly into um, artificial intelligence. As we also know, um, every human right ultimately depends on a healthy biosphere. Without healthy functioning ecosystems, there would be no clean air to breathe, no safe water to drink, or nutrition to nutritious food to eat. So we need to create that and preserve that. And of course, the artificial intelligence may be a helpful tool in this respect, but we also have to ensure that this helpful tool serves its purpose. And that's why we've put together a panel of people that are on the one side scientists and researchers, but also decision makers that have to take on a daily basis the decision to whether or not imply and apply certain methodologies or not. Our uh, very special keynote speaker today is someone who has been involved in the work of the what we call the CAHAI, the Ad Hoc Committee on Artificial Intelligence, but also on the Committee of Artificial Intelligence on the regulation of artificial intelligence for some time. He's a minister, a minister for the environment of the canton of Jura uh, in Switzerland, and he's also the spokesperson on digitalization and artificial intelligence of the Congress of Local and Regional Authorities of the Council of Europe. So I'd like to welcome Mr. Uh, David Ere. Uh, he is uniquely placed in this respect to share his experience as both an active policymaker uh, domestically at, at uh, the canton of Jura and at the European level and someone uh, who has first-hand experience of actually working with those topi topics daily and locally as a minister for the environment. Without any further ado, I would like to give the floor to Mr. Erre, who will speak from Switzerland. He had some urgent business, unfortunately, in uh, is government today, otherwise he would have preferred to be with us here in Kyoto, I'm quite sure. Mr. Ere, if you're there, the floor is yours. Yes, uh, I'm there, thank you so much. Uh, I'm here in Switzerland, it's still the, the, the end of the night, 
So I should say good morning from here, and I'm sure you are already in the afternoon. So uh, it's a pleasure for me to address uh, this session, and I'm really grateful in the name of the Congress to, to be able to share our, our thoughts. Uh, so as you said, I'm speaker of the Congress for Artificial Intelligence and uh, Numerization. The Congress uh, count has a number of 46 states members, and uh, we, this is really a huge organization, and we, we, we try to, to have a, a focus on these uh, thematic that are really important at the moment. Uh, as you said, in my country, I am Minister of Environment in the, in the Canton of Jura. Switzerland has 26 states, and Jura is one of the 26 states. You may know some of the states uh, which are well known, like Zurich, Geneva, Bern, etc. Uh, as a politician, uh, a, grass, a grassroots player in my country, and as a representative of the Congress, uh, I want to share my vision of, on, uh, on this very re relevant connection between AI and environment. Uh, in October 2022, so one year ago, the Congress highlighted that the fundamental right to environment is in, intrinsically linked to local and regional good governance. Indeed, there cannot be go good governance exercised by local and regional authorities without taking into account the environmental issue. So the Congress uh, explored how we can move uh, toward the green uh, reading uh, of the European Charter of, self of Local Self-Government. We adopted a recommendation, and uh, the, this is a proposition to have a additional protocol to the Charter on this matter. Uh, we have several other proposals of international standards on environmental matters within the Council of Europe, including a possible protocol to the European Convention on Human Rights. Whatever option is eventually chosen by the Committee of Ministers, the role of local and regional elected representatives in environmental matters is key. <clears throat> Both the environment and artificial intelligence are high on the agenda of the Congress. The Congress works on raising awareness of elected representatives by sharing good practices with respect to the environment and artificial intelligence through practical handbooks and guidance for smart, for smart cities and regions. Our communities can become better can become better places to live if we maximize the use of AI for the public good. Indeed, AI technologies can be game changers, optimizing the use of energy, handling power fluctuations, improving energy storage, and forecasting energy demand can all help to make energy consumption more sober. AI enables us to analyze complex, multifaceted data, data sets, inclusive real-time data on energy consumption, water use, and weather. I want maybe uh, I want to share my experience in the Canton of Jura in Switzerland. We do have several examples, so I I want to share a PowerPoint. I don't know if you can uh, show it on the screen for the participants. If you have it available. This is just two, three slides that can uh, illustrate my... Uh, I'm sure we do. We'll immediately try to put that on screen. So because uh, it's also, it's always good to talk, but it's also good if I can show you some examples. So in my canton, we, we do have several uh, examples on uh, energy use, energy management, and also uh, public transportation management. And uh, in that uh, topic, I, I don't see anything on the screen, but I think it should come. 
As long as there's nothing on the screen, I would invite you to continue for the time being. We're trying to resolve this technically, but please go ahead. Okay. So uh, in in the public transportation, we have uh, we have implemented uh, something that to to be able to manage the capacity of transportation and the need to be transported by the people. And how do we do that? We do have uh, something that we call we could call an incentive. So whenever you need to buy a train ticket or a bus ticket in Switzerland, the system will propose you several uh, different prices depending of the capacity available in the public transport that is foreseen. So I wanted to show you an example. If I want to go to Zurich next week, and uh, let's say I have a meeting at 12 noon in Zurich, and uh, the system will propose me uh, uh, several possibilities, inclusive one with a discounted price at 12 francs instead of 22 francs. And uh, and uh, this is a, a way to to move the people not in the train and bus that are already supposed to be full, but the one that are uh, that has capacity. And uh, this uh, this this uh, this bring uh, three effects. First of one, we have a better use of public transport, so we use the capacity and we don't overload when it's already full. Second effect, this can reduce the need of extra transport capacity. So this can reduce uh, the investment that we, the states like Jura, like Bern, like Zurich, need to invest in our transport material. And the third effect is also important. This has uh, increased the modal shift from road to public transport. So three effects with a system based on AI and also based on the tools that we have online. The second example I wanted uh, to share is what we have in my region called the Swiss, so Swiss Energy Park. So in my region, we have a, an energy park that includes three kinds of production, hydraulic power on a river, solar panels in a big big solar plant and wind crafts on the mountain and in this park we can analyze online the consumption of the region and the production of the region and we see immediately that uh, whenever we have wind water and sun this is this is quite cool because we have enough energy and during the period like now in Switzerland, where we have sun, no wind, not enough water in the river, then we need to import energy from outside the region. And uh, this is uh, something that I wanted to show you on the slide that are not coming, but this is okay. I'm sure you, you can share the slide by, by later. And on the, on the analysis, Okay, this is coming. So we go directly to the seventh slide. Okay, this is the yeah, the next one because I don't want to repeat what I said. Okay, this one. On this slide, we can see on a yearly basis, the the black line is the need, the consumption of the region. The green one is the wind craft production. So we can see uh, that like in December 2022 or February, we had quite a lot of wind, enough wind to our consumption. The blue is the water production. So we see that the period from August to now, we are having uh, not enough rain in the region. So not enough water in the river, so almost no production. And the sun is also an energy that we have especially in summer and that is not present in uh, in winter so this is this is interesting to see uh, first of all the management of the energy in the region 
also the effect of uh, climate change because we see that when we have not enough water like now due to the climate change we have we are we are in trouble and we can also see that the wind is a really high energy possibility uh, or potential but as it, that, this is not uh, predictable so we cannot say uh, be sure so this is just two examples that i wanted to show and maybe uh, you can come back to the to the third slide just just to show quickly the the okay i come back to this uh, public transportation but on the left you can see that the, this application you can just select oh i want i want to go to zurich on friday november 10 to for a meeting at 12 noon in the middle you can see the possibilities offered so the the one that is arriving at 12 is 14 40 swiss francs and if you want to be like uh, in the previous proposition it's 19 swiss francs and if you want to be at, at zurich at 11 26 you pay the full price 22. so this system uh, is a is a way to uh, as i said to uh, use with uh, the best efficient way the public transport capacity that we have in switzerland so this is what i wanted uh, to show you and uh, i think this is good to make the link between ai and an environment energy and carbon footprint we, we see that they, we have potential and i think there, there are a lot still thank a lot you. to do in this topic thank you thank you so much mr array i think uh, energy management the use of uh, real-time data uh, it's incredibly important and uh, sometimes it may be better to go to zurich a little bit earlier or a bit a little bit later and have a free lunch in zurich to uh, have uh, compensated by your uh, your train ticket basically so thank you for the uh, very much for this very local experience and how how it can ai can really help uh, in um, making sure that our environment is also getting better of it now let me introduce you uh, to the work of uh, our first panelist because mr Ere was our keynote speaker our first panelist is Professor Yamagata from the AO University. Uh, is all about developing a new urban system design framework that integrates architecture, transportation, and human behavior in cities. Professor, if you don't mind telling us about your work on AI uh, and sustainable urban systems, that would be very interesting for this audience, I'm quite sure. What are the main challenges and how did you deal with them? Could you tell us more about this? Thank you. Thank you very much, Chairman. Uh, it is my great pleasure to be able to talk at this session about our recent studies. Uh, Yoshiki, I'm Yoshiki Yamagata. I'm talking from uh, Keio University, Yokohama. So at my laboratory, uh, we are studying urban systems design for achieving climate resilient cities. So climate resiliency is, is uh, uh, two meanings. One is uh, the uh, response to the climate change because we are experiencing a lot of uh, climate change impacts already like heat waves and floodings. Another climate change uh, measure is of course the carbon neutral decarbonization of the cities. This is also urgent to meet the target of the Paris Agreement. So for that purpose, uh, we are uh, introducing a lot of IoT, big data, and AI techniques to achieve, to achieve this goal. So let me explain one example of my uh, studies uh, at the city center Tokyo. Uh, maybe you have seen this sky tree at the city center Tokyo. This is a tourist tower uh, uh, in Japan, and uh, we are analyzing the, this area using big data. And the, so one big data we are analyzing is the occupancy of the uh, offices and uh, shops and restaurants, et cetera, using uh, big data. And uh, 
the second big data case is uh, this uh, mobile phone mobility information. Uh, we are deleting all the privacy information and uh, using the trajectory of the, uh, the people uh, moving inside the city. So we are using the machine learning technique, which is an AI te technology to detect the transport mode. So by looking at the trajectory, AI can judge if this is a car or a train or walking behavior, transport mode. So we started working to uh, studying to improve the accuracy of the classification, but the walking behavior is really uh, challenging uh, for us. So by combining these uh, building and transport information uh, using GIS information like uh, total flow area height and the load with its node and uh, big data like uh, occupancy information and uh, people's mobility information in the buildings and in the uh, load networks in combination of the sensor data like uh, uh, a smart meter measurement data and the statistic and uh, also the actual uh, transport measurement uh, at the load network. Uh, we could uh, estimate the dynamic carbon mapping, which visualize carbon emissions from the urban activities. This red uh, colors means that emissions from the building energy use. Blue color means indicating the emission from the load car traffic uh, from the engine car. So from this diagram, uh, we can easily intuitively understand where the carbon dioxide is emitting and if, who is responsible for these emissions. So it is really uh, important to understand visually intuitively for the policymaker as well as citizens and in many cases uh, uh, building owners and other business people in the cities understand what is the goal of carbon emission deductions so this kind of information is also be used for detecting the heat wave risks by combining heat hazard maps, remote sensing data can be available for this purpose. And we can use this walk, walkers location information as a heat exposure to the uh, disks of a heat hazard. For instance, if an uh, uh, older person uh, suffering some diseases is walking, walking in the street in a very high temperature location more than one hour, so there is a huge chance that this person get heat uh, stroke. So if this, these kind of people are uh, staying in the same place for, for say 1,000 people, then maybe there is a high chance the ambulance will be called soon. So in advance, we can prepare amb ambulance and send the amb enough number of ambulance to the high risk area to save the lives of people who are have suffering the heat, heat strokes. So at the same time, we can also do analyze the comfort of, the, of people. Actually, walking behavior inside the cities is really in, important health improving well-being experience inside the cities. So by knowing how to improve the people's walkability inside the city is really important indicators for their people's health and improving the well-being of the citizens. So there are some new technologies available for this purpose. And the big data and AI for using this uh, people's flow that is really a uh, huge potential. This is an uh, ongoing study I'm conducting with uh, researchers of uh, ETH, uh, Zurich, Switzerland. And uh, so we have a uh, exchange program between Keio University and ETH. So I'm very much looking forward to collaborate with uh, policy makers 
and the researchers in the Switzerland in the near future. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Yamagata. I think that's really exciting uh, to, to look at, um, at this information, how climate resilient cities uh, and decarbonization can impact or hopefully not impact uh, further climate change. I think um, I would only give you one suggestion before you prepare the ambulances to um, prepare for heat uh, stro strokes, uh, maybe more importantly that we foresee some other activity that uh, prevents uh, heat strokes to take place. Uh, our next panelist is uh, Peter Clotten Brock from the UK Centre for AI and Climate. He works in uh, in depth on issues of uh, creating data marketplace in relation to transition to ne net zero and more specifically changing requirements for data uh, for improved grid management. This may sound strange to you, so we will let uh, Mr. Uh, Peter Glotton Brock explain what is meant by all of this. Peter, the floor is yours. Peter, are you there? because we can't, we see your slide, but we can't hear you. Okay, is that working now? Can you hear me? That's perfect, Peter, thank you. Great, thank you very much for the chance to speak today. Uh, it's great to, to be here, if not in person, uh, then in spirit. Um, I'm gonna talk for about nine minutes today about what some of the opportunities are to apply AI and data science to support the transition to net zero, as well as what we can do to help free up some of the data required to do so. to move the screen on, um, excuse me, there we go. Cool. Uh, so a little bit about us before I dive in. So the Center for AI and Climate is one of the leading organizations focused on advancing the application of data science and AI to accelerate action on climate change. Uh, we do this in two main ways. The first is thought leadership. So we look to inform the debate about what, what the main opportunities are to apply data science and AI to accelerate the transition to net zero, as well as what some of the bottlenecks and barriers are to, that are holding back that adoption. And secondly, we look to dive into some of those bottlenecks and barriers and help develop the digital architecture and infrastructure necessary to do so. Perhaps it's useful to start with a little bit of a framework to think about what kinds of problem AI is good for helping to address. Because there are obviously many challenges in the transition to net zero. Some of them AI can potentially help with, others it can, it's not the best tool to be used. So we need to make sure it's being used in the right ways for the right kinds of problem. So here I've just summarized four of the, the types of problem where AI is particularly good at supporting um, the, the addressing of challenges. So the first is system optimization. So this often uses a tool called reinforcement learning, where you effectively um, inform the, the AI agent about a particular system that you're looking to optimize. You give it data on the controls it can use to um, change that system and the environment that, that affects the system. And then it will effectively optimize um, using those controls the, the, the optimal outcome for that system. And this could apply for a whole system. So for example, the energy system, but also parts of that system. So a particular battery asset within that system could be optimized using reinforcement learning, for example. Uh, a particular subset of this um, is around accelerated experimentation. So we can deploy AI to support faster accelerated experimentation for new battery designs and new battery chemistries, for example, um, but also potentially for new ways of making steel, um, which, um, which we need new forms of experimentation for. Thirdly, prediction and forecasting. So a lot of the data that we need that we use um, in sectors relevant to climate change uses something called time series data, um, which tracks different variables over time. And here, if we've got enough historical data on that particular variable, we can find the patterns using AI in that data and predict forward much more accurately using AI than we could with, with previous techniques. And fourthly, classification. So this is useful if, for example, we have map um, image imagery or sort of map satellite imagery, and we want to be able to classify 
and areas on rooftops that we could deploy solar panels on or grid infrastructure or, or whatever it is. And we can deploy AI to help classify different um, data within that image. AI is not something that's theoretical at this stage. We're, it's already being deployed as, as David set out in his examples in Switzerland, but there are many others that we're seeing bubble up um, throughout the community that, that are really exciting. So I've, I've pulled out three that we think are, are interesting here. So uh, the Climate Trace Coalition uses AI and satellite imagery to improve the accuracy of, uh, and transparency of, of global emissions inventories. Uh, secondly, Unisat's Flood AI tool enables high-frequency flood reports that have improved disaster response already in, in Asia and Africa. Um, and thirdly, uh, DeepMind um, have used their AI to increase the energy efficiency of Google's data centers by between 30 to 40 percent, and that's focused on improving the efficiency of their cooling system. So that's just using software. They're able to achieve really significant in increases in, in energy efficiency. It's worth saying that despite the fact that there are a lot of examples um, already deployed, um, applying AI to, to climate action, we still think the potential for further applications is huge. And we think actually it's probably some of the most important ones um, that we're likely to see have yet to be developed. So it's still a, a wide open field and we're just seeing the, the tip of the iceberg when it comes to the potential application. So what do we need to do to enable further um, application and adoption of this technology? Well, probably the main barrier and bottleneck that um, comes up when you talk to the data scientists working in this field is around data. And in particular, two types of data frustration come up in conversations with data scientists. And these are data discovery and data access. So just to be clear on what I mean by these, by data discovery, I'm talking about the process of locating and identifying already open data sets. So for example, an innovator might be searching for solar irradiance patterns in Africa. It might just take them a long time to find this data, um, despite it being already openly available. And by data access, I'm talking about the process of gaining access um, to commercial data that is currently not available um, openly on, the, on the, the internet. So for example, this might be accessing data on EV charging assets from a commercial charging asset operator where they're not currently opening up their data. So then the question comes of what can we actually do um, to enable, uh, to, to address these two challenges that I've, I've focused on. And here we see three key um, opportunities. So the first is better data discovery tools. So ultimately what we think is needed here is better ways of organizing and helping signpost people to data that already exists. So here we think there's a need for a, a well-organized and intelligent data catalog focused on, on climate action. Uh, this is actually something that the Center for AI and Climate is already working on developing um, to really help users and signpost users to where there is data for a particular type. And, and the organization of that is, is really key. Um, if there are any country representatives who want to get in touch about that and find out how that could be um, help support data and um, cataloging in your country, please do let me know. Secondly, we, th we see an increasing need for better regulation to open up data, especially in monopolistic sectors. Uh, so when it comes to climate action, a lot of the sectors that we care about most um, often have natural monopolies, whether it's the, the electricity sector or the transport sector. We're often dealing with, with areas where you have um, sectors that um, companies that have a monopoly over particular areas, whether it's electricity networks, um, such as distribution and transmission networks, or transport networks. And we see a real need to focus on requiring some of these monopolies to open up their data, and in particular for commercial licensing. And that's that last piece is really key. So we want to be able to enable innovators to build um, products and services on top of data that's opened up by these type of companies. So making sure it's available on a commercial license is actually really important. And thirdly, commercial data markets. So to, to complement the, the um, open, open data piece, we actually see there being a real need to create the financial incentives for commercial companies to share more of their data, in particular in, in the sectors that we care about, again, when it comes to climate change. And the way you create those kind of financial incentives is to effectively create a market um, for that data. And again, this is something that we're, we're working on directly. So that, so what I've, I've talked through, um, hopefully, is, is a combination of things. So I've, I've highlighted a, 
um, a framework by which we can think about the opportunities and, and the problem types that AI is good for addressing. Um, I've talked about some of the case studies about how it's already being applied and deployed in the world. I've highlighted some of the, the key bottlenecks, um, in particular around data, that we need to address if we want to see further and faster adoption of these technologies. And I've set out what we think are some of the key um, ways of addressing those bottlenecks um, to address these challenges. So with that, I'll close and say thank you very much again for the opportunity to speak today. Um, and I'll look forward to addressing any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Peter. Very, very interesting also uh, how you highlighted uh, the central role actually that data play uh, in artificial intelligence, uh, the system optimization, if you have access to those data. But you also pointed at a uh, high energy uh, costs uh, for storing those data and also deploying artificial intelligence on them. So our last speaker uh, is going to be, um, we're extremely lucky to have the new director of the Directorate of Science, Technology and Innovation of the OECD, Mr. Jerry Sheehan, who will present the OECD's work and activities in the field of AI and environment, and in particular, the excellent report on measuring the environmental eff effects of AI computing and applications published at the end of last year. So clearly, Jerry, OECD has a key role to play. Over to you to tell us about your work. All right, Th thank you very much, Patrick. Uh, I'm, I'm delighted to be able to join you, even though it can only be virtually today. Uh, as much as I'd prefer to be there in person with you. Uh, let me just say, I do have some slides. I don't know if they can, uh, they can be presented here. I don't seem to be able to pull them up and share my screen myself. But let me, let me go ahead just to keep us on, on time and tell you a little bit about the work that, uh, that we've been doing. Uh, very good, thank you. So just to say that accelerating the green transition has been a major theme, continues to be a major theme of our work here in OECD's Directorate for Science, Technology and Innovation. Among other areas, we have focused on issues of decarbonization of, uh, of industrial activity, including in some more traditional fields like shipbuilding and steel. We recently released a report as well on AI and science uh, that I'd call to your attention as it highlights a number of ways in which AI can be applied to research across a broad range of disciplines, many of which can inform and accelerate our, the, our green transition, including through a number of areas that were just described, through improved modeling, through improved data access and, and ability, uh, and in fields ranging from uh, environmental impact to transportation to material science, all of which can help us uh, make our, our world a bit greener. We have been doing work on AI since at least 2017 and including in that have looked specifically at the relationship between AI and the environment. So as noted last year at the COP27, last November, we launched a report that was asking about the environmental footprint of artificial intelligence. We heard a word about this in terms of some of the, the, uh, the large data sets uh, that must be used to inform AI. And I'm happy to share with you today some findings of this work. And actually the slide we have here is just the right one. So for us, we're, we've been focused on the notion of the twin transitions, the green transition and the digital transition, and looking at ways that digital technologies can be better leveraged for environmental sustainability in the future. As you've heard from other panelists already, this is happening in many ways. Uh, AI applications can enable sustainability, for example, AI is transforming climate modeling by creating digital twins. The destination Earth, for example, is creating a digital twin planet of the Earth powered by Europe's high performance computing uh, centers and its AI capacity. The, the Climate Trace project is harnessing AI to track human related greenhouse gas emissions with unprecedented detail and speed. DeepMind are using AI to make data centers more efficient by applying reinforcement learning algorithms to reduce their energy use. One example is carbon-aware computing, where AI shifts compute tasks to data centers in areas with more availability of carbon-free energy. Let's go to the next slide, please. Just to say that uh, 
but we know compute is on the rise. And as we see computational needs of AI systems going, uh, there are climate impacts as well. We often perceive AI as some sort of an abstract, non-tangible technical system, right? That we interact with through our screens. But it is, as, as noted, it's enabled by physical infrastructure and hardware together with software that are collectively known as AI compute. And in the last decade or more, as you can see on this slide here, the computing needs of AI systems have grown dramatically, entering what some call the large scale era of compute. This is no doubt motivated by the increasing capabilities of, of large and more compute intensive AI systems. And of course, the rise of deep learning and large language models. Tools like chatbot are becoming more widely, uh, widely used and the computing needs for uh, inferencing of AI systems, contrast to the training of AI systems is also becoming more relevant. Let's go to the next slide, please. So why is this problematic? Well, simply put, as AI systems get bigger, not only can they help us address AI challenges, but they need and use more computing resources, which in turn consumes more energy, natural resources, and they produce increasing CO2 emissions. Although some researchers have produced numbers for AI's environmental impacts at, a, at an AI model level, I think a, an example being for Bloom and for, uh, for GPT-3, we don't really know how severe this problem is at a national, let alone at a, a global level, especially then in comparison to, to other sectors that contribute to CO2 emissions. It's because AI specific measures are still scarce and those that we do have tend to overestimate AI's negative impact. So to help fill this measurement gap, uh, we've conducted a stock taking report and developed a framework to help better quantify AI's environmental impacts. Let's go to the next slide. I'll tell you a little bit about the, the analytical framework that we've used. The framework builds on work that has been done already by researchers on the direct and indirect environmental impacts of AI. The direct environmental impacts are defined as those that, that result from AI compute along with the resources life cycle, which includes the production, the transport and operations of this uh, compute, as well as its end of life. There are various environmental impacts, as you can imagine, along this life cycle, everything from critical minerals extraction to transportation, water consumption, carbon emissions, recycling, uh, recycling and waste disposal. For direct impacts, it's important to note that operations that is the actual running and operating of servers in a data center being used to train an AI model, for example, are a major source of environmental impact. The majority of resources and existing indicators are in just this area. We should also note though that direct impacts can also be positive. For example, the heat from data centers is being repurposed, but these cases are, are still probably too rare. When it comes to some of the indirect uh, impacts, that is from the applications of AI, we found many, many positive examples, as well as some that were more negative. So on the positive side, we know that there are sectoral applications. We've heard some of those today already, such as AI for energy grid efficiency. There's climate mitigation and adaption approaches, such as AI for flood, uh, flood prediction, and AI for environmental modeling, such as the example of creating a digital twin of the earth. On the negative side, these AI applications also increase consumption patterns in ways that may or may not be sustainable. So let me go to the next slide, please, and I can share with you some of the key, key findings of our work here. So using this, we, we identified really five key findings that I want to share with you just briefly this morning or this afternoon for an evening for those of you who are joining from other parts of the world. So the first is that common measurement standards are needed to track and analyze the environmental impact. And this should allow for greater data comparability between and among countries. Second, we find that data collection on environmental impacts of AI compute could be expanded, should be expanded in a number of ways. Third, AI specific measurements are sometimes difficult to differentiate from general purpose compute. We see this, for instance, in data center usage, where estimates of the percentage of data centers for use as AI compute is not clear across countries, maybe not even always as clear within individual data centers. Fourth, 
we need more data collection on different types of environmental impacts, such as carbon uh, use, water and other natural resource use and supply chain impacts. All of these are needed. Fifth and finally, we, we think international efforts, including the sharing of best practices on AI compute towards envi environmental equity and transparency uh, are vital. Let me go to the next uh, slide, please. So just to note that this, the framework that we developed over the past few years coincides with the emergence of generative AI. Of course, the big question now is whether the arrival and the proliferation of generative AI would change our analysis. We've already seen exciting new applications of, of, uh, of generative AI for climate action, such as the chat climate. And we also see considerable interest from countries. Right? In a recent OECD stock taking that we did, uh, for the G7, for example, five out of the seven G countries responded that climate action is among their top five opportunities for generative AI. On the other hand, there are questions about the direct environmental impacts of the large scale use of generative AI. For example, on water, it was already reported that Microsoft's water usage has significantly increased last year, largely due to investments in their operations of generative AI. Of course, I tried asking ChatGPT if it knew how much energy it took to run this particular question. But as you see here, coming up with specific numbers is challenging and there's considerable work uh, still to be done. So organizations like mine here at the OECD, uh, through uh, our OECD Compute Expert Group, for example, are continuing this important analysis, engaged with uh, experts and partners from um, various stakeholder groups and from around the world. And we hope to be able to come back to you in the future with even more refined uh, results of our, of our analyses. So for now, I'm gonna go to the last uh, slide. This, and thank you for your uh, attention. This is where you can find our report. And again, we'll have more findings coming out of our OECD Compute Expert Group in coming months and years that we look forward to sharing with you. Thank, thank you, you very much for your attention today, and I look forward to joining in the panel discussion. Thank you so much, Jerry. It's really a question of checks and balances, knowing uh, how much energy is needed to, uh, to generate the artificial intelligence on the one side, and how much is it going to help us to diminish the, um, let's say, the carbon footprint on our development. I already have a number of questions here that come from the uh, online. Uh, and one question, Jerry, is actually directed to, re to you. Um, we know that everyone looks at OECD with regards to defining AI as such. I'm not going to ask you that now, but um, uh, the question here is, uh, what do you see as the role of international organizations, such as the OECD, uh, in um, working with artificial intelligence? Yeah, thank you for that question. I, I think the international organizations like OECD have a, a, a critical role to play here. In, in, in simple terms, uh, we are, we're the, the connective tissue uh, that helps bring countries together to solve collective problems, including around uh, the green transition and, and digital transitions and relationships uh, between them. Uh, I think this is especially critical when the stakes are high. And when it involves complex issues that, that cross borders, and this is particularly relevant for climate change and AI, given that it's a general purpose technology that can be applied to, to many different sectors. We've been focusing on uh, environment here today, but we know that AI diffusion is, is ramping up in almost every sector of our economies from agriculture to healthcare. And again, in, in all countries at different, at different speeds, applications like chat GPT have, have even made AI tangible uh, and usable to, to the average person. So I think we, you know, we at, at OECD and others remain hopeful that the, the breakthroughs that can be enabled by AI can help us save the planet, right? So these are the benefits and we've seen a lot of those in the panel today. We've also been attentive to some of the, the negative impacts, environmental impacts and some of the risks uh, among those, including the effects on labor markets and so forth. As noted, you know, these aren't well, well enough understood yet they're difficult to measure, especially as AI gets scaled up and is applied uh, on, on a bigger scale. And that's where I think OECD and other international organizations have a, a critical role to play because Thank we you. can help put in place uh, measurement frameworks uh, that can apply across all of these countries. 
Thank you. Yeah, yeah, and just and just to fi on, on a final note, as you're, uh, I see you're getting the microphone going. Just to say, yes, of course, I now try to get it. Try to get it going. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much for, for your input. Um, I think indeed, and, and as Council of Europe, obviously we work very closely also with the OECD and other international organizations around artificial intelligence and the impact of artificial intelligence. I, I already have a question, another question for Professor Yamagata, because he showed us quite a number of uh, visualization uh, research, um, use of AI in the sphere of sustainable urban systems. Um, but uh, uh, Professor Yamagata, the question is also, how can these systems be used in policy making? And do policy makers make use of them? I'm sure yeah. that uh, Mr. Ere will be very interested in your response on that. Yeah, thank you very much for the interesting questions. And uh, that is very, vitally important questions. At the moment, we are studying the, this visualizations using big data and AI for the, uh, you know, stakeholders of the area. Of course, this includes the policymakers, but the, usually the policymakers need to see directly the policy options in this visualization, rather than the low carbon emissions. Of course, carbon emission is a final, you know, uh, parameters to reduce. But uh, you are, you are more, perhaps the policymaker need to understand more closely the details of the different policy options, like uh, energy management options or urban planning options, or uh, digitization digitalization options also could be positive and negative impact. So. This is a really important uh, research questions that how to involve policy maker into this, uh, the use of AI. So thank you. L let's ask the policy maker, um, um, Mr. G uh, Are, um what would be uh, for implementing artificial intelligence in local and regional authorities, what, what do you see as the biggest challenge uh, on implementation of artificial intelligence in day-to-day -day policy making. Uh, thank you for the question. I think the, the biggest challenge is linked to the, the, the pri privacy, the protection of the privacy. And what I showed uh, before uh, regarding this energy production and consumption, we try to implement what we call the smart grid. And that needs to implement in every house, in every apartment, a system that can uh, manage the, the need of energy. Let's say you, you come back home uh, at night, you want to load your electric car. So the system, the, like the big brother, should know that you are home, that uh, the next day at uh, like 7 a.m. you want to leave to go uh, to Geneva. So you need uh, the full load. And then the system should manage in the best way to load your car linked to the production capacity and production uh, perspective that we, we have during the night. So if you imagine that the system would be hacked, then that means that the entire life of the people could be uh, transparent and given to the, to the hackers. And this is maybe a big, a big issue that we would have in, in terms of uh, uh, data protection and uh, privacy respect. We don't hear you. Microphones are AI steered, so that basically means uh, my simple intelligence doesn't manage to get it going at the right uh, time. Now, um, Peter, I have, if you're still there, because I don't see on the screen, but Peter, um, uh, there's a bit of a stargazing question for you. That is, what do you think a digitally managed energy system will look like in 20 years' time? Give us a bit of glass ball staring. It's a really good question, and I, I, I'm not sure I'm going to be able to do, a, do the question justice. But I think effectively what we see is that AI will flow into a lot of the decision-making processes um, throughout the energy system. So just starting at the bottom, and if when you're looking at 
um, when a, an asset developer might be looking to develop a, a, a solar farm or a battery asset, um, AI will flow into optimizing those investment decisions. And then for the networks themselves, the electricity networks, they're making decisions around what can connect to the networks, as well as what upgrades they'll need to, to make to the networks. Again, all of those decisions will be optimized um, using AI. And so increasingly, increasingly, I think we'll, we'll move to a system where electricity systems are effectively automated and, and the human um, capacity in them is more to check to make sure that the, the AIs are working in the right way and the way that we want. But increasingly, we'll see those humans in the loop starting to come out of the loop as the trust from the AI system is built. Um, so ultimately, I, I think we will be heading towards a, a pretty much completely automated electricity system, albeit one where there is good um, democratic input, which may be perhaps the, the limiting factor on some of these automation features. Thank you. I, I, I did put you a little bit on the spot there, but uh, I will uh, alleviate a little bit the burden of you and ask the same question because we have two minutes left. So I'll ask the same questions. Uh, how do we see those checks and balances between the use of artificial intelligence? How do, you, how do we uh, make sure that the benefits uh, outweigh the risks in the use of artificial intelligence in the coming years? And since we have uh, four speakers, you have 30 seconds and uh, to reply to that. Shall I start with uh, uh, David? Uh, yes, uh, exactly. The, I think the check and balance, we need to be careful with the energy cons consumption of the AI uh, hardware and the benefit in terms of environment and energy saving thanks to AI. So this is where I see a, a big challenge for us. 20 seconds. Hello, thank you. Uh, Professor Yamagata, 30 seconds. The checks and balances for the future. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, actually, uh, it is very important to, to, to see the benefit understand the benefit of the users of the system. So if the user enjoys the benefit, uh, I think they understand why uh, this system actually useful for, for the community. If they don't understand this is just a scary, you know, privacy <laughs> problem. That's my point. Thank you. Jerry? So I, I, yeah, I would, I would say that the way to do this is to ensure we've got a, a, a principled-based approach to AI, whether it's applied in, in, in with the energy grid, whether it's applied in transportation or others, uh, that adheres to what I would say are the, are the OECD principles around AI, which include issues of, of transparency, engagement. It's a human-centered approach, which I think is what we were just hearing about engagement of, of the public and understanding uh, the benefits, the, the risks, and, and having uh, uh, the opportunity for transparency into the, the policymaking process and the system development. I will just note that we at OECD are in the process of uh, reviewing uh, the 2019 AI recommendation with a view toward its revision, and, and this is happening at the time when generative AI is raising a number of new questions. Uh, so we hope to have something more to report on that in uh, 2024. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, with this, we are right in time to have uh, finalized the discussion. Sorry, Peter, I haven't given you back the floor a second time on this uh, very difficult question. Thank you for the audience uh, uh, online and here in the room to have followed this session with so much interest. Thank you for the many questions that we received and um, thank you for, for your active participation. Thank you so much. Bye.